Great. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone for, for joining. Uh, my name is Tony Douglas. I'm the head of governance for the Stanford Blockchain Club. Um, we are incredibly excited to have Ori from DORG join us to give us a DAO overview. Um, you know, I, there's a lot of excitement around DAOs. Uh, I know a lot of people have, have reached out to me and we've had great discussions. Um, so I'm hoping that we have a great discussion here. Basically, we're gonna start out with a 20 to 30 minute presentation by Ori, um, followed by a facilitated Q&A um, with me, and then we'll open it up to questions uh, from the audience, but please just throughout uh, to the extent that you have questions is not available um, at the tone. Please record your message when you To the extent that you have questions throughout, please ask um, and Ori and I will be keeping an eye on the chat uh, just to make sure that we're covering everything that people want to talk about. Um, cool. So without further ado, I will pass you, Ori, if you could just kick off the you know, background on yourself and, and the org, and we'll get going from there. For sure. Thanks. Um, and I see that screen sharing is disabled. So if you could yeah, let me make add that, then I'll just a co-host really quickly. And you cool. Should go. Cool. You should, you should be good. Great. I'll get started. Yeah, so a little bit about myself. Um, I've been working uh, kind of professionally in the DAO space since 2017, but got involved in the crypto space in about 2014, 2015, when I found out about Bitcoin. And kind of the first thing um, my mind went to is how could you extend this from just send value from account A to account B to how could you do this, these more sophisticated like multi-party banking applications where you know there's uh, shared decision making over what happens with money, and so we today we call this DAOs. But at the time, I was just looking at the Bitcoin scripting language and how that could be possible. Um, and then Ethereum came about, which made it a lot easier to build sort of sophisticated peer-to-peer uh, -peer applications with value involved. So um, yeah, a couple of years ago, I started uh, Dorg with some other uh, engineers, which is a DAO-run Dev Collective that builds. Um, Crypto, pro, uh, crypto software, blockchain software for different crypto projects. Um, and I've also been involved with various um, legal research in the DAO space and how it kind of can interface with the, the existing legacy systems. And we can get into all of that kind of as I walk through an overview of what DAOs are and what's going on in the landscape today, how people are dealing with the challenges that's involved with DAOs. Um, but yeah, feel free to ask questions as I go and I'll keep an eye on the chat there. Tony can let me know to check. Cool. Uh, so yeah, DAOs are kind of confusing because um, just kind of like blockchain itself, it's this really new sort of uh, organizational technology or uh, political technology um, that, that people haven't quite grasped what it's for yet. But there's been kind of enthusiast communities around the tech for enough years now that a lot has been thought through about what the potential is here. And then today we're starting to see the actual experiments come to fruition and start to bear fruit. But um, there's, there's still like this very rapidly shifting discourse and taxonomy and, and tooling frameworks around what DAOs actually are. So like maybe we can back up and um, just talk about the, the key components of, of what uh, the acronym stand for, stands for at least. So, it's decentralized autonomous organization. And so usually when, when people say the word decentralized, they mean uh, it isn't controlled by like a small group or a single person. Um, and that I kind of think of this as it's uh, resistant to like internal collusion. Like it, it, it's resilient to a small group or subgroup of the whole taking over and taking control. And then uh, autonomous is the other key word. Uh, which to me is, is really about um, its independence from other systems. So it doesn't rely on like um, another company or a state like government to, to grant it its ability to operate or on, on banks to allow it to manage finances. It uses a blockchain. And so it's kind of um, self-hosted and it can't be taken down or can't be interfered with. It basically follows the rules that it's programmed to work by. And, and organization to me just basically means that there's people involved. Um, this is kind of a debated 
uh, aspect of the kind of uh, definition of DAOs, whether it needs to be like real humans involved. Um, but yeah, in my, in my opinion, the, the key fact of a DAO is that it's, it's enabling people to do something together. It's not just this um, smart contract that's enabling some simple like financial swap to happen. It's, it's actually about like decision-making between a group of people. And yeah, I can kind of sum it up with these uh, key kind of like uh, qualities of DAOs. So if you if you zoom out, it's it's basically just a digitally native way for people to make decisions, manage resources as a group. Um, and so so if you think about like the legacy systems that people use to like coordinate together, uh, we, we can pull out like a couple of key differences here. So you know, in most um, uh, governments or like corporations or nonprofits, uh, they're, they're basically, their fundamental substructure is, is uh, bureaucracy. So they use, you know, legal documents, uh, paperwork, um, agreements to basically um, like dis determine what the rules are for how they coordinate. Uh, whereas in a DAO, it's, it's code that is the underlying substructure that drives everything. Uh, and so, so the business logic is executed by the code that's a, uh, programmed ahead of time rather than um, executing uh, things by administrators who follow what the what the paperwork is telling them to do or what the law is telling them to do. And, and then like we said before, the decentralized aspect means that um, it's not necessarily hierarchical. Um, there, there can be many different structures implemented for how decisions get made. Um, and also in, in a typical like corporation or, or government, uh, things are basically private by default um, you know, things are in private databases or, you know, paperwork, and they're only um, trans made transparent if they're kind of compelled to be transparent. They're, they're private by default, uh, but maybe like laws can compel transparency. And then lastly with DAOs, um, they're natively global. So, you know, they're instantiated on a blockchain that could be accessed anywhere, um, that can be interacted with from anywhere, and largely they're open to participation from anywhere. Yeah, so um, I'm going to fast forward to like what, where DAOs have gotten to today. I'm sort of skipping the history. Like you can find a lot of details online about uh, the evolution. But today there's sort of like a taxonomy emerging of what people are starting to use DAOs for because it's, it's an incredibly general technology uh, or general concept even. But, you know, it's, it's like hit uh, product market or DAO market fit in certain areas first. So I'll, I'll quickly run through these and then we can. Um, go back through the challenges that come with organizing as a DAO. And you can think of how those challenges apply to these different like use cases that have emerged. So yeah, the first is um, investing. So like investing clubs. Um, this is kind of the original, the DAO in 2015 on Ethereum, the first attempt at doing a DAO was really just a decentralized VC. It was a bunch of people on the internet pull their money to invest in uh, tokens that will um, yield cash flows or rise in value or fall in value. And, and they basically make those bets and then share the profits. And so there's a couple of DAOs and DAO frameworks today that are um, focusing on this use case. Um, and they basically look like uh, uh, investing syndicates or um, yeah, more non-hierarchical uh, VCs. And you can imagine kind of the benefits of this in terms of uh, pulling capital and also leveraging the knowledge of all the different people that that's capital is being pulled or maybe delegated to like fund managers that have uh, accountability to the providers of the capital. Uh, similarly, uh, collector DAOs have been this, I'd say the newest category. Um, since the NFT boom earlier this year, um, people decided, okay, well, these NFTs are really expensive. What if we pull money into a DAO? to make NFT purchases together. So it's really still um, investment. Um, actually, some, uh, a pretty interesting one, just, just saw it on Twitter like today, is Constitution DAO. Uh, some people, I think it was a couple thousand, 3,000 people pulled uh, maybe $4 million uh, to purchase like one of 11 or 12 copies of the US Constitution. And so we'll see if that actually goes through. But yeah, it's, it's made, made some headlines today. Um, yeah, a couple months ago, there was like Pleaser and Flamingo got, DAO that got started. I think uh, Pleaser made some high-profile purchases 
of, of NFTs that had different like cultural significance. Um, and you can imagine kind of where this extends, you know, beyond like the NFT hype, uh, it, it could basically be extended to any sort of like property titles. So yeah, ne next, uh, this is more like maybe relatable uh, for like a, from a day-to-day -day perspective is professional services. So instead of um, going to a company uh, that's run as an LLC or C Corp to get your uh, legal services or your dev services or your marketing services, or your design services done, uh, you could go to a DAO that's basically organized as um, a service provision DAO. So um, yeah, like uh, examples here, uh, for example, Dorg, uh, which I'm a part of, uh, does dev services. LexDAO is a legal services DAO. Bankless does uh, media and marketing. And Deep Work is, is a design studio that's organized as a DAO. Uh, ne next, public goods. So, you know, DAOs don't have to be organized for the profit of their members. They can also be organized for like uh, broader causes, social causes. And so, Vita DAO is an interesting one that's working on longevity research and other kind of um, health, health uh, research areas. And they're basically uh, monetizing the IP rights in NFTs, um, but but looking for like um, specifically like high impact uh, problems to solve in the health space. As uh, SciDAO is is doing something similar with uh, psychedelics research, and Klima with uh, carbon credits. Moloch uh, was was started to fund uh, Ethereum uh, core infrastructure research. Uh, next, uh, we have like social clubs, another really new one. And so the idea here is that token represents access to a club. So it represents like access to um, maybe uh, events or a discord. And you can imagine like all the directions this goes kind of like uh, the sporting world is also starting to see a lot of fan tokens. And you can see those becoming DAOs where the DAOs kind of manage uh, what the football club like normally manages, for example. Um, and I'll rush through these last two. I mean, these, these two are the most uh, common, I would say, in the landscape today, which is managing like DeFi protocols. So instead of like a company managing um, a financial protocol um, like Sushi, which is a swapping protocol or index, which uh, creates uh, financial products that bundle together other financial products, they have a DAO managing this. So they have uh, all the token holders voting on the changes to make and then sharing the profits from the system. Uh, and then what? Yep. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I, I was going to say not to get us too out of order, but I, I know that you have the the case on D org. I'm getting a couple of questions here just to get a bit more flavor around the services that you all provide. Um, so I, would it make sense? Is it okay to hop to that page and then just sort of expand upon what type of projects you all take on? Sure, totally. I'll I'll just get through this last one and then I'll hop to the D org case study and then work back through the considerations. So just, just the last one to mention is similar to the financial protocols. There's other sorts of platforms that could be down managed. You can imagine in the future, there would be things like um, ride sharing marketplaces or social networks. But today we have NFT marketplaces, Metafactory, which is a merch um, company or merch platform and uh, Bobo, which is actually like an L2 and then Tezos, an L1 that's managed by a DAO. But yeah, let's, let's go over there. So Tony, could you read the exact question? No, just around the services, I think there, there is one question around which of the um, different buckets of DAOs you, you all tend to serve um, and what, like just an example of the type of projects you all take on, like what, what are you doing um, for, for these DAOs exactly? Yeah, definitely. So yeah, we, we started off, so yeah, uh, Dorg started off basically as a, a Web3 Dev Services Collective. And so we will provide services for regular uh, companies, crypto companies, but also for DAOs themselves. So we can work with regular corporations um, that are basically startups uh, in crypto, but also with DAOs, with actual DAOs that um, are token holder governed or reputationally governed. And so examples include like, um, yeah, like for example, NFT marketplaces, DeFi protocols, uh, people building social tokens, basically everything I just went through, um, we're, a group, we're a group of engineers that helps them to build what they're looking to build. So uh, we have like this structure that I can show you like a little diagram of a really like uh, crappy hand-drawn one I made today. 
which is um, that clients that we basically spin out these individual project wallets that will service a particular client. And then um, there'll be a sourcing team that's responsible for like putting together this statement of work for that client. And then the client pays the project wallet and the funds get um, routed between the uh, sourcing team. And then uh, 80% stays for the execution team to split up between the software engineers and the designers. And then 10% goes to the Dior treasury, which is um, collectively governed by all the Dior uh, rep holders. And so that that's what we use to like fund our operations, administration, growth um, through roles and, and basically like uh, kind of more dynamic budgeting for any sort of work that people do. And, and do you all tend to manage like the stuff on the right, the expenses, internal roles um, by just proposals that are put forth to the token holders and it's just a, a weighted vote based on how many tokens you hold? Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's pretty simplistic. Um, the governance from the treasury perspective, it is like one token, which we call like rep reputation, one vote. And so um, that's, we use a tool called Snapshot where you can vote through just uh, signing a message. So you don't have to pay gas, but effectively if there's more votes, yes than no, after a certain period, it's considered passed. Um, but the, yeah, basically the, the way we've done that over time is iterated a lot because there's problems with kind of attention fatigue, voter fatigue, you don't want every day, every single um, kind of payroll request going through the governance of the entire organization. And that's why we've kind of, like, come up with a segmented architecture where each client project, the vast majority of their funds is managed in these individual multi-signature wallets. And it's only the 10% that accrues in the shared treasury that like everyone has to pay attention to. And so we've come up with basically like this monthly allocation cycle so that um, the, uh, the budgeting decisions get made at a monthly cadence. So people aren't asked like every day or three days or randomly, um, hey, what do you think about us spending on this or on this? But those basically get collected into a proposal that gets made uh, once a month. Gotcha. And, and last question, and I'm, I'll let us continue forth. Um, yeah, yeah. There's like a, a growing field of DAO tools, right? For treasury management, for employee employee management and the like. Do you all use any of those tools? Yeah, absolutely. So we we started off using a tool, a framework called DAO Stack a couple of years ago which was um, used it used like a more sophisticated voting system with like a prediction market baked in, but basically it was very gas intensive um, and, and too uh, overbuilt for what we needed at the time. And so we migrated about a year ago to Gnosis Safe, which is the most popular like multi-signature wallet. And so we use a combination of Gnosis Safe and Snapshot for the voting. Um, and so every client project has its own Gnosis Safe and then the Dork Shared Treasury is a Gnosis Safe. And now we're working with uh, Gnosis Safe uh, with, on their Zodiac framework, which is basically like um, a DAO extension for the Gnosis Safe so that you can automatically enforce the results of a vote um, on Snapshot to release funds from the safe, if that makes sense. And I can talk really briefly about kind of, yeah, what, what that door story looked like. So yeah, it definitely st started slow, very experimental. Um, kind of the first DAO to need to figure out uh, the legal side of things because we were actually interfacing with actual corporations. We weren't just like living in blockchain world. We were trying to like run an actual business as a DAO, basically as an experiment. Um, and yeah, like as the um, crypto bear market kind of came to an end and, and like the, the crypto industry got moving again. Um, yeah, like things got way more active. We started working on like a variety of projects. And yeah, before all that, we we... Uh, incorporated in Vermont because they actually had a special law that uh, says that you can manage the operations and, and governance of your uh, of your company through uh, blockchain based uh, software. So it, it was kind of interesting because they were the first state to kind of uh, set something up explicitly for that purpose. But since then, Wyoming's also incorporated a law that's friendly to DAOs. And then people have made experiments in other states without explicit like laws on the books, but using like older laws.
Yeah, and I, I can go, if there's more questions there, I can definitely like even screen share like some stuff about the Dorg handbook and uh, like specific processes, but it might help with the context. I'll just go quickly through, um, yeah, like key considerations, a lot of which I already talked through when talking about the other DAOs um, and, and that we've experienced with Dorg and come up with our own solutions for. But yeah, the, the first question is like, what is actually being governed? So in, in DR's case, it's uh, work requests. So it's accepting whether or not to do this project with this client or to um, accept this um, engineer into the collective or this designer. Um, and also then to how to spend the, the funds that accrue in the treasury. And so there's a question of like, how does the decision-making rights actually get distributed? So in a lot of DAOs, it's token holder voting and the tokens are traded on open markets. And so that's more analogous to like a publicly traded company, but that's not actually a good fit for every case, right? That's, that's what get talks about the most. But for example, in Dorg, we came up with a mechanism basically when we got started two and a half years ago of um, lifetimes weighted um, or lifetimes earnings weighted voting. So basically with every dollar you get uh, for being a contributor to Dorg, you also get one rep and the rep is non-transferable. So if I earn $500 this week, I'll get 500 rep also. And so the, the voting over time basically is distributed across um, according to how much value each person's added in theory. And so there's, there's also like variations on what you can do once you have like a distribution of power, whether it's tokens or non-transfer rep, reputation, you can, you can have the, yeah, the voting weights be just um, one token, one vote or one rep, one vote. Uh, if you have like a concept of identity, you can also quadratically weight votes. So you can take like the square root of someone's voting power to make it um, less concentrated if that's an issue. Um, you can also have people like lock up tokens and the longer your tokens are locked up for the higher voting weight you have. That's how uh, curve DAO works, for example, which governs the curve swapping protocol. Um, yeah, and then there's a question of like, what is actually being governed? Like, wh why are we getting together and doing this? So, you know, in case of the investment DAO, they're, they're investing, they're governing the decision of what to invest in. Um, and in the case of um, Dorg, we're, we're deciding on um, how, to, yeah, like I said, how to spend our assets and who to work with. But then also you can uh, govern the literal like parameters of a system. Like for example, compound, the governance uh, decides on like the uh, liquidation parameters and the asset whitelist that the system supports. And then of course a DAO can also govern its, itself. So you can upgrade uh, the, uh, the DAO's own uh, voting mechanisms. Yeah, and, um, for, for a lot of DAOs, contributor onboarding is like the key, I guess, differentiator between uh, success and failure. Because if you're not gonna like attract and retain the best people, then nothing's really gonna happen. Just like a, you know, normal company. And so in, in DAOs though, there's this kind of like unique problem because we don't have these like tried and true uh, hiring best practices. There usually isn't like a hiring manager um, or even like job postings in the traditional sense with employment and full-time salary. So th things are t typically more flexible and people come in and out. And, you know, lots of people are contributors to multiple DAOs. So <laughs> there's, there's a question of whether, um, being a member of the DAO is permissionless. Like I said, um, some, some DAOs, you just buy the token on the open market and use that to vote and maybe even use that to get access to their like private uh, coordination channels and, and then weigh in on decisions versus a, a community like Dorg where we're, we're more tightly um, filtered. And so the existing body of rep holders have to vote in like any new person. Um, yeah, there's also like retention questions. Uh, for example, like in you know, corporations, there's the idea of like equ uh, equity and options for employees. And so DAOs are definitely experimenting with that, uh, like at a rapid pace and, and everyone's going sort of like a different direction with whether there's, you know, clawbacks for tokens that people earn or whether your uh, rate can go up over time and the extent to which you can make all of that programmatic. And then, um, yeah, as DAOs get larger, it gets difficult to just work as like a monolithic group, you know, so, so projects get segmented into, you know, working groups that will focus on different areas. Or in our case, we have the different squads that work on different client projects, as well as working groups within like the, the DAO part of the management. 
Ori, I um I have a couple of questions that I should probably just sprinkle into the previous slide rather than wait to the end. Um, it actually lends to it. Um, so so one of which uh, one question that just came in was how do you think about building culture within DAO? Um, obviously, you know that's critical to sort of retaining talent in more traditional forms of organizations. How do you all think about it at Dorg, and how, how have you seen like other DAOs think about it? Yeah, that, that's a huge. Uh problem and like area that people have been trying different like approaches to i would say um sort of like a, a traditional company it's the early people who who start the thing who set a lot of the direction um but the idea is that they're not always in charge right just because they started it and so there has to be like a firm kind of underlying uh purpose for what the project is doing to really drive things and i've seen that the best way of making that a reality is being really articulate and like having a vision statement, having a handbook that people have shared access to, like in a GitHub repository that different people can edit. So yeah, I think handbooks have been really popular uh, tool for like culture building and sharing like um, setting like shared visions. And then also just like the, the culture of like working, you know, online and being like natively remote. Um, there, yeah, there's like Discord um, as like a workspace and there's voice channels and things like weekly calls or like maybe bi-weekly or monthly uh, larger calls where people can kind of share updates of what they've been doing, um, present new ideas. And so that's all really important for people feeling like they, they can come in and then drive things, right? So acting first, asking later, that, that's like a key thing we've been instilling in Dorg is that, you know, you come in and maybe you're new, maybe you wanna like uh, go slow at first and learn what's going on. But ultimately, like if you see something that could be improved, um, yeah, you should be feel comfortable stepping up and uh, suggesting how that should be done. And so, yeah, I think handbooks and then also forums are a big tool for that. So discourse.org has been a popular uh, tool for hosting more like uh, deliberative discussions where you can structure conversation around different topics and Last, last thing I'll say about culture is uh, like sort of like a code of conduct is, is something that I've seen be become more popular lately. So we didn't have one. And then, um, you know, inevitably there was like some personal conflict between like uh, members. And then we were like, okay, well, we don't have like a source of truth for um, what is right in this situation. So, you know, someone stepped up and drafted like a code of conduct and then got feedback from other members of the DAO and then basically got it approved. And then that gets like edited over time as we have more experiences. No, that makes that makes complete sense. There was a follow up question as well um, around: is there a is there a limit or an ideal size or best practices around the size of the group involved in a DAO? Um, and you know, for example, you got you mentioned this was an experiment, and you guys are experimenting, and ultimately anyone you know that forms a DAO, it's you're going to go through this experiment and experimentation phase, right? Um, do you have any sort of advice on keeping it small at the beginning or keeping it to X limit over time? Yeah, definitely. I think keeping it small at the beginning is the best way to go. And like having a group of people that are all on the same page and then slowly letting on more people that kind of get what the, the vision is and what's going on or like a good fit in terms of their skills. Um, but yeah, I've seen a lot of projects go like a different direction of really like building hype and, and like launching with um, trying to get hundreds of people, if not thousands of people into the discord, into the token, like really early. I, I don't think that's going to have a lot, lot of longevity because it's ultimately going to end up being like really centralized because most people won't know what's going on and they'll revert to like trusting whoever started it. Whereas if you like grow slower, then you can, you can have the new people who come in, like actually get oriented and like have a sense of agency. Um, but yeah, I don't think there's a magic number because DAOs is just such a broad category. So for a different kind of uh, use case, you're gonna have like different size requirements. Um, I, I personally have this concept like Dunbar DAOs where like DAOs generally won't be like single units once they grow past like maybe 70 to 150 people that are active contributors because that's kind of like what our brains can handle like in terms of um, maintaining like, regular connections and understandings of other people. So yeah, like the DAOs 
yeah, it's, it's like an open topic of whether DAOs are going to enable like these massively scaled organizations that are way bigger than like multinational corporations today, or if DAOs actually enable scaling in a horizontal manner where there'll be just tons of smaller DAOs and they'll just be very kind of like try to like robust mechanisms for like interaction and deal making and value flows like between DAOs. And that you can see like fed, like uh, federations, basically like, um, yeah, stacking DAOs on top of each other, like in sort of like, um, yeah, like a emergent property of the system where, where larger things get done, but uh, you're actually like, coordinating with smaller groups. Yeah, and, and maybe last question here and um, we could keep pushing forward. Um, so this, this question of coordination, it seems to be, you know, a, a big issue, right? Like sort of absent having a defined hierarchy and leadership, you know, there's questions around decision rights and who leads what and who's dictating how folks are coordinating and building these work units. Um, how, how do you all think about that challenge at DORG and, and how have you seen others address it, whether through, you know, committees or other, other uh, formats? Yeah, I think that um, being non-hierarchical doesn't mean that there isn't structure and leadership. So there can be um, individuals who either step up or are asked by other community members to step up to like handle a particular domain and be the point person. And so I think as long as those um, structures are clearly articulated and um, yeah, like visible, then like DAOs can still work as coordination mechanisms without in, without basically giving like the the people who are responsible for certain domains or the point people um, necessarily like unilateral authority or, over those domains. Like you can basically bake into contracts like um, the pr parameters of, of what they can do if they're granted those kinds of like positions. And so it could be something completely off chain, right? Like maybe you're just the person people should talk to for um, recruiting if they want to join. Um, but Or maybe though you're kind of like a spending admin and you're able to get reimbursed automatically for expenses of a certain size. And that, that kind of thing would be baked in on chain. And then there'd be like enough auditability that if that was abused, it could be like um, turned off. And so I think it kind of depends, but yeah, le leadership and structure are paramount, like even more so uh, when there isn't like a de facto hierarchy. Yeah, makes makes total sense. Um, there are still some questions trickling in, but maybe we could keep moving forward and then um, I'll, I'll stop this again and ask a couple where they make sense. Great. Yeah, and so I think I covered, started covering this in the last slide, but um, yeah, definitely budgeting and financial planning are difficult when um, there isn't these um, fallbacks of someone in charge of the finances. And so this is where mechanism design becomes important. This is where like visualization, dashboards, um, kind of notifications are important. And this is all tools that like are not yet robust and mature in a DAO space, you know, to know how to make the spending kind of in line with what the cash flows are or what the fundraising was. And then there's different ways of going about like how fundraising happens. So, you know, token sales and bonding curves, you know, are kind of mechanisms that have become popular, but there's, you know, many more mechanisms out there in the world, um, like debt financing that you that really haven't come to DAOs yet. And this is just, uh, I'll share the slide deck, but um, these are linked to different uh, recent articles from the last year that kind of give like really thorough <laughs> overviews of what's going on in the space and the tools. Um, and then I think I, yeah, I missed the tooling slide. So I'll quickly run through tools you asked about. So there's kind of DAO frameworks where you can use these. These are actually like smart contracts you can use to deploy different kinds of DAOs that have different um, kind of design philosophies behind them. Um, for communication, like I was saying, Discord, Discourse, Handbooks, and Gitbook or something like that are really common. And then there's uh, other, other tools that are built kind of on top of the frameworks that let you visualize what's going on in the DAO or interact with the DAO because ultimately your DAO lives on a blockchain. And so you, you're not dependent on the particular app or framework that you used to launch it. Uh, that's just uh, like a, maybe a GUI or a software library that helps you uh, get the DAO deployed and maybe interact with it. 
but you, you can build your own app for interacting with your DAO. Um, or you can use one of these other apps that other teams have built for making DAO interactions easier. So for example, Utopia Labs has features like reimbursement requests, um, salaries and stuff like that, uh, that actually just use under the hood a Gnosis safe. So you can, you can make like these higher order um, like mechanisms and coordination like norms on top of really simple smart contracts. Then in the utility section, I have some uh, tools that help with uh, voting like snapshot, sig like kind of signaling what people uh, desire. DeepDAO is an aggregator where you can see um, lots of stats about different DAOs and then coordinate and source credit are tools for distributing um, compensation to, to members in these kind of more distributed ways like source cred takes data from lots of different sources to come up with like a distribution of credits that, that different members could get for contributions they've made on, let's say GitHub or conversations in discourse and coordinate lets people give points to each other every like epoch. Let's say you set an epoch for two weeks and then it can auto distribute uh, funds or tokens based on like the points that everyone gets. I think I can leave it there because uh, yeah, I went through some door stuff here, but I can, kind of dive into more questions now. Yeah, thank thank you for that, uh, by the way. Great presentation. Um, a quick shameless plug on, on the tooling page. We have uh, Julia, the co-founder of Orca Protocol coming in on, on Thursday. Um, but anyway, no, great, great presentation. Thanks again, Ori. We have a handful of questions coming in. Um, I'll start with this one from uh, Davis W. Um, he said for, Investment DAOs, how do you ensure that there's leadership in the organization to appropriate, appropriately diligence and make the best investments um, without giving up the aut autonomy or decentralization? Yeah, diffusion of responsibility would definitely be an issue in a naively constructed investment DAO. But like uh, that, that's been the problem that I think these newer, like next gen investment DAO frameworks have been trying to solve. Um, I don't know, you know, in Meta Cartel Ventures and the Lao, which are, are like two of the recent, like ones from last year, if they have something explicit in place to incentivize certain people over others. I know in the traditional VC world, you know, they overcome this problem with, um, you know, uh, partners having outsized carry, outsized uh, upside in the, in the deals that they bring in. And so there's nothing to stop um, you from programming that into like an investment DAO framework. I don't know how syndicate works yet. I think they're still in private alpha, um, but syndicate is, is looking to do basically like a, um, a framework for, for investment DAO. So I, I would, yeah, I would encourage you to look into what they're doing. But um, yeah, there's this project I can't remember, but it was attempted a couple of years ago where basically you had, um, it had that separation between like the GPs and the LPs that, um, that like traditional VC has where, you know, certain people are just putting their money in and not and they're passive they're not making decisions and then other people have like carry have like an upside incentive and they're the ones making the decisions um and so they they incentivize to make the decisions that like uh will yield returns but yeah short answer is there's probably a lot of ways and you can look to the traditional to figure them out but i doubt many of them have been explored in the DAO space yeah, and, and maybe a question that goes along with that, um, you know, a big challenge within DAOs is participation. Um, you know, we have all these folks that, that have tokens and in theory could participate in the voting, but don't actually. And, and maybe the same folks are, are really the ones that are driving uh, the decision making over time because they're the ones that participate the most. Um, have you have you seen any like kind of organizational best practices, if you will, for encouraging participation within a DAO? Yeah, definitely. So one thing we do in Dior is we have this concept of being active or inactive. So even if you've um, earned a lot of uh, rep over time, if you go a quarter, like a business quarter without um, either having earned money or voted or participated in a discourse conversation that you, you become inactive. And when you're inactive, um, you don't get like our quarterly bonuses that uh, basically flush out like the tokens, the various project tokens we've earned during the quarter um, and then you don't have access to like our private channels so in that way uh, we encourage even people that aren't 
actively working to kind of like be abreast, like up to speed with what's going on in government governance and at least vote once uh, in the quarter on that. And so you, you can imagine similar things like that. I think it's it's not simple to, to create those incentives because they could just be gamed. Like let's say it's a DAO with uh, thousands of people and you, you have to vote um, to receive some sort of like kickback. Um, then Then someone could make like a, bot service that lets you like randomly vote just to make sure that you collect that um, incentive. Yeah, I, I can't think of others that have done successfully with, with incentivizing um, participation. One, one thing I'll say is that might, not, that might not be the best way to go about it. Um, you know, it, I think it'd be better to design systems where it doesn't require the constant attention of everyone to operate smoothly. To me, the definition of like a maximally autonomous DAO would be one that requires the minimum, the lowest amount of attention possible from its members to still make decisions and allocate resources in the best interests of its members. So if I'm in a DAO, I have membership tokens in it um, and I really just have to pay attention like once a year and still, and yet the whole thing still like does whatever it is I'm interested in, whether it's cancer research or making me a return on investment, um, then that that would be like a really well designed DAO because I, it doesn't need to like encourage me to spend a lot of my time on it. And so prediction markets are a pretty interesting path for this if you're interested if you're uh, interested in looking further. No, really interesting stuff. I um, there's a question here from Alexandria that said, "Can you explain the key difference between open source development and DAO DApp development?" I guess. You know, I'll I'll sort of augment this question as well by just saying anything where you could just, I guess, approach it as a collective to solve some problem. Um, what what is the benefit in doing so in a DAO structure beyond just yeah, doing it, you know, as as a traditional collective, right? No, I think it's a good question because you know, free open source software has been around for decades, um, but it's been largely even though lots of like the entire like uh, world of software is built on top of it. Uh, it's, it's largely marginalized and the people making the key open source contributions aren't necessarily capturing the value from it. And so what's interesting about DAOs is it mixes that kind of like open source coordination, you know, a, a kind of horizontal uh, stigmergic uh, contributions with uh, value flows and money. And so you can bake compensation and uh, recognition into the process of like, let's say developing software or, or doing some other sort of like um, collaboration. So I think a, a cool project to look into is Radical, R-A-D-I-C-L-E. Uh, and, and they're basically um, doing like Git, like a decentralized GitHub, which has DAOs integrated. And so, you know, popular repositories um, will like auto uh, compensate the highest uh, contributors. There's also a question here around um, for like key strategic decision making that executives typically make, um, like acquisitions, um, pivoting into new industries, or you know, I, I can imagine Dorg might have some big decision on whether to uh, to accept VC funding, or for example, and then play that forward. Like, if there was a potential acquisition, is that something that um, really should be governed by everyone? Like, should everyone have a say in that? Or is there some world where it's like a core group of folks that have more information and expertise to actually drive that decision? Like, I guess this is more of, do you have an opinion on, I suppose, on one versus the other? Yeah, I'd say it, it really depends. I think typically those bigger um, strategic questions actually are the ones that should more so be taking into account the preferences of all the stakeholders. I think a good example of this is uh, Sushi Dao had a controversial debate over whether to accept VC funding, basically to do a strategic round. And so, you know, someone made a post, someone who had been talking to all the potential investors, and they wrote down the terms. Um, and then it turns into this massive debate, and basically the community turned down the proposal. And so, you know, you could look at it as like backfiring, but I think it actually shows like the Dao working. And like the token holders ultimately um, didn't support that 
move that like the insiders, let's say, uh, or like higher like info access people were trying to push forward. Um, so yeah, I, th I think like inevitably it's gonna be smaller clusters that like uh, come up with ideas of what to push forward. But um, if, it, if it's something that affects kind of the direction of the entire project, then it would make sense to have like that input. And I think as long as the, like, it's the stakeholdership is designed well, like whether it's uh, staking your token to generate voting power or earning like some sort of non-transferable voting power, then that you know would result in the decisions being made that follow the preferences of those stakeholders. Um, yeah, and I, th I think there's this interesting concept of like the you should delegate um, tactics to leadership, like delegate like the the execution of, of like nitty gritty administrative stuff to single central parties or you know trusted parties. But strategy should really just be this um, thing that comes from the bottom. It should, it should be like what the you know the people who put the effort in or the capital in uh, want. That, that's purely my opinion. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And, and I'll, I'll actually provide two shameless plugs. So when I started my Dow journey, I was like going through YouTube University. Um, and I, I'd say um, two videos in particular were, were very useful. One was sort of that debate um, that ended up on YouTube with, with Sushi. Um, and then two, there's a, there's a three hour long Dow summit um, that if you just Google Dow summit on YouTube, I mean, sorry, just type in, in the search bar on YouTube Dow summit. There's a discussion towards the end back to this question of like collectives versus DAOs and open source versus DAOs. Um, there's a fellow in the, the Center for Blockchain Research from Stanford that had a session solely on that um, in the middle of that discussion. So um, you can see in the description like the times at which various discussions were happening. His, uh, his name's Jonathan Doden, if you wanted to check that out. Um, which which kind of leads me to the next question. Ori, what would your recommendation be for people to start digging into resources. I think there's so much here and you provided a great overview. Um, it could be somewhat overwhelming. I think oftentimes folks um, approach me asking like whether they wanna start a DAO, where do I start? Or if they just wanna learn more, where do they start? So what would your answers to those two questions be? Yeah, it's not simple because the, the resources are really scattered all over the place. But I think uh, a good starting point might be to go to let's say uh, deep DAO here or even coin gecko and like filter by like certain parameters and then you know go to the twitter or the landing page or the discord of DAOs that you think are interesting and then go from there because they should have information on like how to get involved and so you know if you're thinking of starting your own DAO i would definitely say get involved in like an existing DAO first even if completely informally you know just watch one of their weekly community calls or land in their discord and follow whatever the instructions are for how to get started. Um, you know, you don't actually have to do work and try to get paid for it. You can, you can just kind of lurk and see how they're doing things, what the, you know, contributor onboarding experience is like, um, you know, how well they've documented things, um, how they're managing their treasury. Cause that will give you like a starting point for thinking about like how you would want to do your own DAO. And also there's just immense, immense opportunity in working for existing DAOs because last I checked deep DAO, at least like the AUM of, of DAOs has ballooned to $15 billion recently. Um, you know, it's probably less than a billion in January, I would, I would say. And so there's this huge asymmetry of, of like demand and need for, for talent and like supply of capital and like lack of um, people who know about DAOs who are getting in there, who are like um, professionals who are um, experienced with, with different like, um, yeah, domains that these DAOs need. So I think the need is there. So like, if, if you would like to work for a DAO, it's there. Um, yeah. Finding out like which DAO, what's going on. It, it's, it's crazy. There's so much information out there. Um, but let me just close on, on that question with Twitter is definitely useful, although distracting. Um, but also like newsletters and podcasts. So there's like a couple of good newsletters out there, like Week in Ethereum, um, F Hub, Bankless, um, and and corresponding podcasts. Um, yeah, and, and I could post some of that stuff. And I also have, I think there's a page in the Dorg Handbook with some resources 
But um, yeah, like th those kinds of information sources are good <laughs> to kind of get interested in something, but then just go down the rabbit hole, just like follow, you know, follow the white rabbit, read the docs, get in the discord is probably the best way. And I, I put this back up because these are ones that I was like kind of biased towards in, like highlighting uh, that I think are interesting. And so if you want to look at any of them up, um, it might, you know, take you other places. No, this is great, which which probably brings me to uh, my closing question, which is, I mean, there's there's just so much that's possible um, in the future with DAOs. Um, yeah, could you just paint a picture of what you think sort of the, the future of DAOs and the future of work through DAOs looks like and maybe of these, which you think are some of the most exciting projects? Yeah, I, I think it's like a full spectrum future where we use DAOs um, basically for everything. So it's, it's, you know, your workplace. It's also how your neighborhood or your municipality is governed. Um, it's also how um, relations between different like geographic areas happen, uh, political parties. And so it's just basically like more transparent, like auditable um, user or member governed. Uh, services or uh, decision making. So, yeah, I, I I think that it's gonna take a while, and it's gonna be weird. It's gonna start with like memes and like get rich quick shenanigans, like like we're seeing today. Um, but and weird social clubs. Um, but but like it's what starts as a toy, you know, eventually uh, becomes serious. Um, at least like with exponential technology. So. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd be on the lookout for things that are like, seem like toys, but like pique your interest, because I think that's going to be where the discoveries and innovations happen that actually like move the needle forward and solve some of these like key problems like um, that I went through. No, I completely agree. And, and I, uh, I'll just reiterate this point on there's so much work to be done and to the extent that any of, of what we're covered today is of interest no matter what di discipline you're coming from right it doesn't need to be as an engineer i think there's um so much to contribute to this space so um yeah by all means keep digging in and exploring there was a, just as a as a final question it's not really a question but if if you could go to the original page you had um there were a couple of people asking for your contact information if you're Cool with sharing that. Of course, yeah. Great, and and just uh, thank you again. I I think this was this is tremendous. I'm getting a lot of people messaging me, um, just talking about how much they enjoyed this. So thank you for putting this together, um, Ori, and and we'll be in touch soon. And thanks everyone for joining. Thanks. It's been fun.